And now that I've explained why patients with congenital heart disease are blue, let me go on to talk to you about the major congenital heart diseases. And if you recall, and I told you earlier on, that the major congenital heart diseases are divided into two big groups. In one big group, our patient is cyanosed and blue. We have a blue baby. And in the other, our patient is not cyanosed and is not blue. So let me first deal with the ones where there is no cyanosis, where our baby is not blue. So these babies must have an uncomplicated auricular septal defect or an uncomplicated ventricular septal defect, an uncomplicated ASD and an uncomplicated VSD. And that immediately reassures us. When we look at the list, the first one you see on that list, acyanotic congenital heart disease is a ventricular septal defect, a VSD. A ventricular septal defect is quite a common acyanotic congenital heart disease. And why is it of importance? Well, it's important for two reasons. Firstly, because these patients with a ventricular septal defect previously pose the risk for infective endocarditis and ought to have been put on prophylactic antibiotics. However, in light of the extensive research and the good work carried out by the NHS and the NICE report in 2014, the NICE guidelines, patients with a ventricular septal defect no longer pose a risk for infective endocarditis and do not need to be put on prophylactic antibiotics. If you have a VSD, a ventricular septal defect, the oxygenated blood is going to go from the left to the right and that puts an enormous load on the right side of the heart because it's got its normal blood flow to deal with plus that of the shunt's blood flow. And the amount of blood going through the pulmonary circulation may be several times more than the amount going through the aorta. The other thing that happens sometimes in a patient with a VSD, with a ventricular septal defect, is that the patient can reverse their shunt. I told you previously that if you have congenital pulmonary stenosis, that will increase the pressure on the right side and the patient can reverse their shunt. But these patients, patients with a ventricular septal defect, because of the large pulmonary flow, may develop an obliterative arthritis of all the small vessels of the shunt and that increases the pressure on the right side and the patient can then reverse their shunt and then the patient who was previously not cyanosed and not blue can become so. This you will hear from time to time and is referred to as the Eisenmenger complex. How do you make a diagnosis of a ventricular septal defect? Well that's easy. If there is a hole and a shunt and that is being pumped by the left ventricle, it's going to make a noise as it goes through the hole in the heart and there will be a murmur. And if there isn't a murmur, you can pick up this defect by the Doppler ultrasound or if you like, you can put a catheter in the heart and show that the chambers on the right side of the heart, which should have desaturated demoglobin, deoxygenated blood, have a higher oxygen content because of the flow from the left side. So that is his importance to you. Normally patients with a ventricular septal defect are not cyanosed and are not blue unless and until they develop this Eisenmenger complex. Blood flow through the lungs may be tremendous. And you can pick that up with a chest x-ray showing very large pulmonary arteries. And if there is a murmur, you can pick that up by the Doppler ultrasound. This is easily repaired surgically, so you close off the VSD. If you are a dentist and they came to you for dental treatment, if you are a doctor and they came to you for surgical procedure and nurse, previously patients with a ventricular septal defect ought to have been put on prophylactic antibiotics. However, in light of the NICE guidelines, in 2014, patients with a ventricular septal defect do no longer pose a risk 
for infective endocarditis and do not need to be put on prophylactic antibiotics. Previously, it was thought that there was a risk, not necessarily because there was a valvular lesion, but where that ventricular jet of blood impinged on the opposite side of the heart, on the lining of the heart, on the endocardium. That's where it was thought that injury could occur and infection or infective endocarditis could start, but not on the valve. The second sort of acyanotic congenital heart disease that there is is called an auricular septal defect, an ASD, and that is precisely what you see on that list, the second form of acyanotic congenital heart disease. But there isn't much more I can tell you about an auricular septal defect that I haven't already talked to you when I was talking to you about a ventricular septal defect. Patients with an ASD are normally not cyanosed and are not blue unless and until they develop this isomega complex. Blood flow through the lungs may be tremendous and you can again pick that up with the chest x-ray showing very large pulmonary arteries, or if there is a memory, you can pick that up by the Doppler ultrasound. Or if you like, you can put a catheter in the heart and show that the chambers on the right side, which should have desaturated hemoglobin, deoxygenated blood, have a higher oxygen content because of the flow from the right side. This is again easily repaired surgically. The risk of infective endocarditis is small. Even prior to the NICE guidelines, in 2014, patients with an ASD did not need to be put on prophylactic antibiotics. However, in light of the NICE guidelines, patients with an auricular septal defect certainly need not be put on prophylactic antibiotics. Probably because the pressure by which the blood goes from the left to the right is much smaller. You're not dealing with ventricular outflow under high pressure, but with a left auricle which doesn't have a jet effect and will not damage the endocardium on the opposite side of the heart. The only other congenital heart disease that is acyanotic normally, but which again can develop this Eisenmenger complex, is called a patent doctor's arteriosis. A PDA, and that is precisely what you see, third one on that list, a patent doctor's arteriosis. Now that is of some importance because it's the connection between the aorta and the pulmonary arteries. It goes directly through. The pressure in the aorta is obviously much higher than the pulmonary artery, so the flow is normally in that direction. We all have a patent doctor's arteriosis before we are born. And what we do is, we close it off when we are born, when the lungs begin to function. I said that's what normally happens. In some patients, this doesn't happen. And if it doesn't, then you're left with a large fistula between the pulmonary arteries and the aorta. And that puts an enormous load on the right side of the heart. Because it's got this normal blood flow or this vast blood volume from the right ventricle and this important contribution from the aorta. And if you were to listen to these patients, you will hear a murmur arise. And it lasts throughout the whole of the cardiac cycle, which is sometimes called the machinery murmur. Shh, 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 this sort of noise. Or if you like, you can put a catheter in the heart and show that the chambers on the right side, which should have desaturated hemoglobin, deoxygenated blood, have a higher oxygen content because of the flow from the aorta. Or if you like, you can pick this defect up by the Doppler ultrasound. If they came to you for dental treatment or surgical procedure previously, patients with a patent doctor's arteriosis pose the risk for infective endocarditis and ought to have been put on prophylactic antibiotics. However, in light of the NICE guidelines in 2014, patients with a PDA, patent doctor's arteriosis, no longer pose a risk for infective endocarditis and do not need to be put on prophylactic antibiotics. 
This is repaired surgically or it can be treated surgically by closing up the ductus itself and this usually happens in the aorta just below the left subclavian artery. So there are three quite important acyanotic congenital heart diseases, a ventricular septal defect, an auricular septal defect and a patent ductus arteriosus. Previously, these patients posed the risk for infective endocarditis and ought to have been put on prophylactic antibiotics, but patients in light of these nice guidelines no longer pose a risk and do not need to be put on prophylactic antibiotics in 2015. You are not blue. These patients are not cyanose. These babies are not blue. You are not blue if you have a hole in the heart. Unless and until something stops the pulmonary flow. And that could be congenital pulmonary stenosis or it could be the Eisenmenger complex by which you form and occlude all the small vessels of the shunt and therefore increase the pressure on the right side and reverse the shunt. You obviously make sure that if you have an Eisenmenger complex, you want to treat that. Well, you can't do that by closure of the shunt. You need a new heart and lungs. If you have an Eisenmenger complex, it would be an indication for heart lung transplant. Right. If there are some acyanotic congenital heart diseases, then there obviously must be some cyanotic ones as well, and I'm afraid there are. And these are the ones you read in the newspapers. They're called blue babies. They're born blue. These patients, if they have an auricular septal defect or a ventricular septal defect, an ASD or a VSD, must have something else in order to make them blue. And the one that you probably all heard of and know of is called the tetralogy of fallow. Tetralogy means four things. And here they are. The first part of that tetralogy is that the patient has a VSD, a ventricular septal defect. That wouldn't make you blue because oxygenated blood is simply going to go from the left to the right and therefore oxygenated blood is still coming out of the aorta. The second part of that tetralogy is that patients have pulmonary stenosis. That will make you blue because it will increase the pressure on the right side of the heart and the shunt now reverses. And instead of oxygenated blood going from the left to the right, now deoxygenated blood, desaturated hemoglobin is going to go from the right to the left and end up in the peripheral circulation. And it is the fact that you have desaturated hemoglobin in your peripheral circulation is what makes you blue. And it is reckoned that you need five grams of that before you appear blue clinically. You normally have 15 grams per 100 ml. If a third of that is desaturated, you will look blue clinically. The third part of that tetralogy is that they have an overriding aorta. The aorta, instead of exiting from the left ventricle as it does normally, it now writes across both ventricles so that desaturated hemoglobin, deoxygenated blood is being pumped by the right ventricle directly into the aorta. So pulmonary stenosis will make you blue, but an overriding aorta will help you go bluer. And the fourth part of that tetralogy is that they have right ventricular hypertrophy. But that's unimportant. I mean, if, and it's not surprisingly, if you have congenital pulmonary stenosis, you're bound to have right ventricular hypertrophy. But I think old fellow was looking around for something just to make it four and he put that there. But that is unimportant. A ventricular septal defect is important, but that wouldn't make you blue. Pulmonary stenosis is important and will make you blue and an overriding aorta will help you go bluer. But how do we pick patients up with fallow? Well, that's easy, because they're born blue, they're blue babies, and they have finger clubbing. You recall me telling you previously there are two cardiac lesions which produce finger clubbing. We've had them both now. One of them is infective endocarditis, 
and the other is any form of cyanotic, congenital or cyanotic heart disease. A condition in which there is expansion of the distal compartment of the fingers. So if you hold them sideways, you lose the angle between the nail, which is this thing, and the nail bed, which is behind it, the thing behind it. There is normally an obtuse angle. That gets flattened out, and there is soft tissue expansion of the finger so that it looks like the end of a drumstick, and that is called finger clapping. There is a big white ventricle because it says so up there, and because I told you earlier on, if you have congenital pulmonary stenosis, you're bound to have right ventricular hypertrophy. Or you can pick this defect up by the Doppler ultrasound, or you can show that there is desaturation. If you put a catheter in the right, in the left ventricle, you can show that there is desaturation. The risk of infective endocarditis with phallus tetralogy is small. So patients with phallus do not need to be put on prophylactic antibiotics. This can be treated surgically. If the baby is very young, what they do is the anastomose, an artery, the subclavian artery, to the pulmonary artery, beyond the stenosis so that the lungs are oxygenated. This is called the Blaylock calcic procedure. It's not a perfect thing to do, but it's sort of an emergency operation where babies go through in order to stay alive. But in a baby or in a child over the age of one, this is eminently treatable these days. So you close off the VSD, you put a new pulmonary valve, or you split the one that there is, and you shift the position of the aorta so that it doesn't exit from both ventricles and exits from the left. The right ventricular hypertrophy will disappear of its own accord and happy days. Mom and dad can breathe again and our patient, our baby who was previously knocking on heaven's door, can start looking healthy and normal again. And this is called a total correction. Some other interesting things happen when you see patients or babies or kids with fallows, you see them squat. You see them squat on the floor because they are less short of breath by doing that. This is because you can stop and occlude the blood going into the right auricle and take the strain of the heart in that sort of way. You see them squat in order to relieve their dyspnea. The second form of cyanotic, let's work in threes, there are three acyanotic congenital heart diseases, an ASD, a VSD, and a patent ductus arteriosus, and there are three cyanotic ones. I'm only going to mention you the other two, just their names, and just tell you a very brief thing about them, because the most important cyanotic congenital heart disease that you'll ever come across is called the Tetralogy of Fallow, which I've covered for you already, but let me remind you that there is a condition called tricuspid atresia, where the right ventricle simply fails to develop, and there is an ASD, and therefore deoxygenated blood is simply going to go from the right to the left, and there is a single ventricle. This is obviously not a good situation because there is mixing of the blood, and then obviously therefore our patient is going to be cyanosed. This can be treated surgically. And the third form of cyanotic congenital heart disease that there is is called transposition of the great vessels. Where you are born with your aorta coming out of your right ventricle and your venous drainage going into your left ventricles. This is obviously not a good situation because you have two separate circulations which are in completely inappropriate because you have blue blood, dirty blood, all the time in the periphery and clean oxygenated blood in the lungs. This is called transposition of the great vessels and this can be corrected surgically by an operation called the mustard operation, where they fashion a connection between the right and left auricle to connect the two circulations. I hope this has been useful. That's all I have to say about congenital heart disease. And if you like it, please leave me a comment.